Hey, hi, hello, welcome to my channel. I hope you are doing well. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope you stick around. A special hello and thank you to my returning subscribers. I am so happy to have you here. Today's case comes from a request from a viewer, and I would like to thank Cynthia Schmidt for recommending this case to me. It was quite a doozy and I had not heard of it before. This is the story of a beautiful woman and a horrible man. Zazelle Preston was a remarkably pretty woman and a spark plug as well. She was a spunky free spirit who had plenty of friends and family who loved her and she loved them back. Her life wasn't perfect, but she should have had more years to live and love and receive love in return. Many more years. But one man took it all away. And the ending of her life and the ending of this story is one of the most horrific endings I have read and learned about in a while. It is something quite disturbing for sure. This is the story of woman abuser and killer William Wallace. Zazelle Preston was born in 1985, and from a young age, she was always a beautiful girl. She grew up in Orange County, California, and grew up in a few different homes, that of her mother, an aunt, a brother, and her grandparents. Her family and friends sometimes called her by her nickname, Zizi, short for Zazelle. Zazelle was a tiny girl with a fit frame, and she was a great dancer. She loved ballet, and she loved art and illustration as well. She loved fashion, and she had aspirations of getting into modeling and also maybe a career as a makeup artist. And as you can tell from the photos I have shown, she was definitely a beautiful woman. Pink was Azelle's favorite color, and later in life she was known for wearing a fedora hat. Zazelle Preston had great style. In high school, Zazelle became pregnant, and she gave birth to a baby girl. She worked multiple jobs working hard to support her daughter, who was the light of her life. Later, in her early 20s, she met a man and she became pregnant. And for the second time, she gave birth to a daughter, five years after she had her first daughter. Zazelle now had two beautiful little girls. The relationship with the father of her second daughter didn't work out, and Zazelle was a single mom. But she hustled and she made it work. Zazelle was resourceful and her daughters always had what they needed. Zazelle was a great mom. But it was soon after the birth of her second daughter that another man came into her life. And this time, his name was William Wallace. William Wallace was about four years older than Zazelle. And when they met, he was working as a dock worker. After his time in high school, Wallace had worked multiple labor jobs. Wallace and Zazelle's relationship was rocky and very intense from the start. I'm not sure what happened in Zazelle's prior relationships with other men and what those relationships were like and whether she had any experience with domestic violence previously, but this relationship with Wallace was violent from the beginning. Court records show that soon after Wallace and Zazelle began their relationship, the violence began. And Zazelle didn't just sit and take it, she fought back and she made law enforcement aware of what was going on. Wallace was arrested and found guilty for abuse as early as 2008, only one year or so into their relationship. His sentence was 45 days in jail with probation to follow and required attendance in a batterer's treatment program. And after that very first serious incident, Zazelle Preston got a restraining order against Wallace. She was doing the right things. She was taking the proper steps to protect herself and her children, but William Wallace was able to talk himself back into her life. She did still love him and she wanted the relationship to work. She was a forgiving person, but as time would tell, she was willing to forgive the wrong person and eventually it was a fatal mistake. 
back together once again. The peace between Zazel and Wallace unfortunately did not last long. Wallace was arrested at least two more times, going back to jail each time. Wallace's most recent arrest and placement in jail was in April of 2011, only nine months before the tragic ending to which this story is leading. It was also around that time in April 2011 when Zazel learned that she was pregnant. William Wallace was the father. And Wallace was very excited to learn about the pregnancy, especially when Zazel learned that she was going to give birth to a baby boy. He promised yet again that he was going to change his ways. For real this time, he said. And this time he brought religion into his persuasive tactics. He told Zazel that he had found Jesus in jail. He had found God. He wanted to marry Zazel and help her raise her two daughters and for them to raise their baby boy together. He told Zazel and her family and friends that he wanted to live as a man of faith. And Zazel believed him. She had a strong background in faith and there was nothing she wanted more. She wanted to live in peace with Wallace and for them to raise their family together. That's what she hoped for, dreamed for, and she wished for. She posted Wallace's photo on her Facebook page and she talked about how much she missed him and how much she wanted him home. Because Wallace, during this whole time, was still in jail, but he would be out soon and coming home. Zazel was really looking forward to it, and this time she seemed to believe everything about his story. She was full of hope, her pregnancy was going well, her man was coming home, he was going to do right and live proper, and they were going to live happily ever after. And during that summer of 2011, against the wishes of her family, who still saw Wallace as bad news, Zazel Preston agreed to marry William Wallace. And after they were officially engaged, upon his release from jail in July 2011, he moved into Zazel's apartment in Anaheim, California. In the photos that Zazel posted on Facebook of both she and Wallace, she captioned them, Lovebirds for Life. But summer ended, and along with the ending of the summer season, the peace between Zazel and Wallace ended as well. At the beginning of fall, Zazel had enrolled in classes at the local college called Cypress College. In a sad and ironic twist to this story, Zazel Preston wanted to be a domestic violence counselor. She had enrolled in the Human Services program at Cypress College, and she was working towards her certification in domestic violence counseling. So when Wallace moved in and Zazel started to take classes at the college, Wallace stayed home to take care of Zazel's two daughters. And according to family, Wallace hated that Zazel was going back to school. He couldn't control Zazel when she was at school. And Wallace hated not having control. He always wanted to know where Zazel was and what she was doing. In fact, Zazel's family would later report just how jealous and controlling Wallace really was. They said that he didn't like Zazel to talk to any men, not even her sister's husband. Not only was Wallace controlling, but he was violent. As Zazel's family later said, they alleged that he had threatened to kill his wife on several occasions. Zazel's grandmother reported that she had found a pregnant Zazel lying curled up in the street after one beating. She reported that Zazel had called her with a cell phone, asking for help while hiding from Wallace in a convenient store bathroom. Still, nothing would stop Zazel from pursuing her dreams. She wanted a good life for her daughters and her unborn son and for herself. And she wanted to persevere and obtain the certificate that she was studying so hard for. And her family supported her goals as well. In fact, for one of her classes, Zazel had written a paper about domestic violence. Zazel had written the paper and she had asked her mother to type it for her and print it out. In Zazel's paper from her own research, she detailed statistics about the cycle of domestic violence and what potential victims should watch out for. Her paper cited these statistics. 
Alarmingly, nearly 5.3 million United States women are victims of domestic violence each year, resulting in 2 million injuries and 1,300 deaths. She described the cycle of domestic abuse this way. Number one, the tension building phase, which may be accompanied by minor assaults, during which time the woman believes she can deflect her husband's bullying by conceding to her husband's wishes. Number two, the battering episode. At this point, the man is out of control and acts in a rage. And number three, the reconciliation period. Here, the batterer transforms himself into a very apologetic, tender, and loving character. Zazel's paper also included her hopeful words, quote, as a domestic violence advocate, I will show these victims that there is light at the end of the dark, gloomy tunnel. It is very likely that as Azel was learning about the facts and the patterns of domestic violence, that she was applying that knowledge and that insight into her relationship with Wallace. Zazel knew what the signs of abuse were. She knew that those signs were in her own home. Zazel was not a dumb woman. She was smart. She knew what was going on. But she was also still in love. And when things were good, they were very good between Zazel and Wallace. Wallace always found a way to pull Zazel back into the relationship, even though Zazel's brain probably knew better. And on November 7, 2011, Wallace and Zazel Preston were married. But not even 24 hours would pass without a problem. That very night, the couple's wedding night, Wallace beat Zazel. And because of that beating, Zazel's unborn son went into fetal distress, and she had to be induced at the hospital. She went into labor, and on the very next day, November 8, 2011, her baby boy was born. Her son was perfect and beautiful, and Zazel's two daughters were proud big sisters. Her family was happy to welcome this new addition to the family, and they hoped that this would bring peace to Zazel's life. Wallace had his son. It should have been a peaceful and happy time, a time of bonding with the new baby and enjoying life as a newly married couple. But it would not last. It was never going to last, and Zazel had finally begun to accept that fact. And she knew that she would have to make a change. By Thanksgiving of 2011, Zazel had realized that she had made a big mistake in marrying Wallace. She confided to her mother and to her grandmother that she wanted to get out of the marriage. She had realized that all of the things that she was studying in her classes applied to her own life as well. But she didn't leave. Perhaps she just couldn't quite do it, not yet. She wanted to finish her finals first. She wanted to get through her classes that semester, she told family members. On December 17th, 2011, Wallace and Zazel fought again, and he ended up throwing her out of her own apartment. Yes, he threw her out of her own apartment. Zazel called her grandmother, who came to her rescue. And over the next hour or so, Wallace decided that he was going to leave the apartment instead, so Zazel and her children could return to it. So when Zazel and her children returned home, Zazel's grandmother later recalled the screaming match scene. Wallace had screamed, I'm leaving and not coming back. To which Zazel had replied, good, don't come back. But of course, he did come back and it would not end well. In the days leading to Christmas, the fighting and the arguing and the beating did continue including one incident in which Zazel ended up in the ER at the West Anaheim Medical Center. Wallace had left her with a damaged eardrum, Zazel told her mother at the time. Still, Zazel stayed. Her family members and friends would later say that Zazel just wanted to get through the holiday season. She wanted to give her daughters and her new baby a great Christmas. As good of a Christmas as she could. Every mother's want that for their kids. Her daughters were eight and three years old. This was the magic of the Christmas holidays for them. She may have been planning her escape from Wallace in the new year, in January. But Wallace was a time bomb, and he was tick, tick, ticking. 
as Zazel's grandmother reported later, as she was out shopping with Zazel a few days before Christmas. Wallace was calling Zazel the whole time, checking to see where she was, who she was with, and what she was doing. And that shopping trip with Zazel was the last time her grandmother would see her alive. And then it was Christmas Eve. On the night of December 24, 2011, Zazel and Wallace went next door to their neighbor's place and they were drinking alcohol and having fun. And later that evening, the couple returned to the apartment they shared with their children, Zazel's two daughters, who again were about eight and three at the time, and their newborn son. Zazel was 26 years old at the time and Wallace was 30. A witness would later report that they had heard loud arguing coming from Zazel's apartment that night. And there was arguing going on in Zazel's apartment because Wallace and Zazel were fighting again and he was beating her yet again. The exact order of events that happened in their apartment that Christmas Eve night is unclear. Wallace's account of what happened changed based on who he was talking to afterwards. He told the police one version, Zazel's family another version, his eventual cellmate another version, and another version altogether to his own family. But what we know for sure is what he did on Christmas morning. At around 9 a.m. on Christmas Day, Wallace placed panicked phone calls to various family members, including Zazel's family. He stated in a worried tone that Zazel was not waking up. Prompted by their pleas for him to call for help for Zazel, Wallace placed a call at around 9.30 a.m. to 911. He reported that his wife needed medical attention. And it may be that more than one person called 911 to get help for Zazel. When the paramedics arrived, they found Zazel Preston slumped on the sofa, unresponsive. And what exactly she was doing on the sofa, we'll get to that later. Zazel was taken to the hospital, where she was later pronounced dead. Zazel was 26 years old, and she had died at the hands of her new husband and the father of her newborn son. The county pathologist said that Zazel had died from brain hemorrhaging due to one or more of six blunt force blows to her head. Four areas of trauma were on her face, and two were to the back of her head. According to the pathologist, all had occurred within the same time frame. When questioned later whether the injuries appeared to be due to a fall or application of blunt force trauma, perhaps by another person, the pathologist had responded, I would say blunt force trauma inflicted injury, not a fall injury, because of the multiplicity of injury present here. Police at the scene discovered areas of blood throughout the home. And although it was unclear as to when these holes were punched in the wall, they found several holes in the walls as well. Also, a door was sitting aside off of its hinges. And all three children had been home during the time of this incident and for Zazel's death. So, what happened? Right away, to his family and to the police, Wallace claimed that Zazel had gotten drunk and she had stumbled and fell into a glass table in their apartment, shattering it. He and Zazel's oldest daughter had tried to clean her up, bringing her into the bathroom and pulling out glass shards from her body. He said that she had seemed okay enough, but that he may have bumped her head, getting her in and out of the bathroom. Then somehow Zazel had gotten into bed and he had fallen asleep beside her. In the morning, Christmas morning, he had had a hard time waking her up, and so that's when he had called his family. He told them that Zazel had fallen and hit her head. She must have gotten a concussion, he said, and she never woke up. At first, Zazel's oldest daughter, the eight-year-old, supported what Wallace said, saying that she had seen Zazel, her mom, stumble and fall into the glass table, shattering it into pieces. She told the detectives that she thought that her mom must have tripped and that she did try and help clean up her mom afterwards. Later, however, at the trial, Zazel's daughter testified that at the time of the incident, she had been scared of Wallace 
and that he had coached her into what to say to the police. And that's a believable statement. She must have been terrified of the man who had been beating her mother. One of the family members that Wallace had called that Christmas morning was Azelle's grandmother. At the time, the grandmother had told detectives that Wallace had said that he had, quote, tossed her around a bit the night before. At the trials, Azelle's grandmother, who was then at the age of 90, had said that she didn't remember that specific quote, but instead remembered Wallace telling her that he and Zazelle were, quote, drinking and horsing around. These are two contradictions, minor contradictions, that Wallace's lawyers would bring up at his eventual trial. Zazelle had just died from an accident, his lawyers would say. From an accident that resulted in two people drinking too much and arguing too much. Wallace's defense attorney stated the following, Mr. Wallace is being accused of something that is not his fault. In this trial, you will hear about a relationship that was full of arguing and yelling, but also a lot of love. But what the police and the prosecution allege what happened in that apartment was far more horrific. In response to what the defense lawyer said, the attorney for the prosecution had this to say, The defendant did what he always did. He expected Zazelle to survive like she always did, but this time she did not. The following is what has been pieced together based on crime scene evidence, forensics, the autopsy, and witness testimony. Wallace was arrested the same day that Zazelle was taken to the hospital and pronounced dead. It was still Christmas Day. In the days following his arrest, Wallace freely talked to the cops. He talked to the first officer on the scene at their apartment, and then he talked twice to detectives. He kept changing the story he told the police, to his in-laws, and eventually to a cellmate. Through extensive investigative work, it appeared that there were at least four moments in time that evening when Zazel sustained head injuries. The first event was in the bedroom. They had returned from the neighbor's party and they were arguing. Wallace pushed her and she just fell back onto the mattress, he told the police. No big deal. But the version that he told the cellmate was that he allegedly, quote, creamed her. At the trial, one of Zazel's family members would state that Wallace had told them that he and his wife were drinking and during the argument he, quote, tossed her around a bit. The second head trauma event happened outside of the apartment. Wallace says that he wanted to leave the apartment, and Zazelle followed him down the stairs of their second floor unit. She was begging him not to leave, he said, and they argued and they fought some more. Wallace told his cellmate that he had shoved her against an iron fence, and she fell, hitting her head. This was similar to what he told police. He said that he had pushed her into the railing, that she had stumbled to get up, and that she had fallen hitting her head on the concrete. This does support what first-hand witnesses had testified to at the trial. A witness said that they saw Wallace picking something up that looked like a body at the apartment gate. During the trial, the district attorney said that Zazelle had been trying to run away from the apartment, but Wallace had grabbed her and pulled her back in. The third injury to Zazelle's head happened in the living room. Wallace told the first officer on the scene that Zazel had fallen at the door of their apartment and landed face first on a glass coffee table. He said her fall shattered the table. Wallace told his cellmate that from the outside he had carried Zazel back up the stairs into the living room and stood her up. Wallace had said that she couldn't maintain her balance and that she fell, hitting the glass table. Later, the prosecution would allege that Zazel didn't just simply stumble and fall into the table. They alleged that Wallace had pushed her into it. The fourth head trauma event happened in the bathroom. At some point, Wallace said, he had noticed that Zazel was, quote, gurgling and having trouble breathing. But instead of calling 911 for help, he tried to revive her by putting her in the bathroom, putting her in the tub, and turning on the cold water but blasting cold water on her didn't work. And after that, while dragging her out of the tub, somehow Zazel had hit her head hard against the toilet. 
Wallace told police he pulled her out by getting behind her and grasping her torso. But in his conversation with Zazel's mother, he said he had pulled Zazel out by her feet. The investigators wonder if he had dropped Zazel at this point, and the fall had made her slam her head against the toilet. In any event, the prosecution would later allege at Wallace's trial that he had also inflicted blunt force trauma to her head throughout the night, throughout that big fight, and it rendered her unconscious. And that thought is believable due to the many documented instances of abuse that she had already suffered at his hands. The exact order of these four head trauma events is unclear. They both had been drinking heavily that evening, and it's possible that Wallace himself cannot remember things clearly. He told police that from the bedroom, he had carried Zazel into their bedroom and laid her on the bed. It was reported that by this time, the couple's seven-week-old newborn son was crying and likely hungry, so Wallace had put the baby at his wife's breast to nurse. But Zazel was not moving. She did not respond to her infant son crying. And Zazel's daughter would also report that her mother was already cold when she was taken into the bedroom. Wallace told police that he passed out on the bed next to his wife, Zazel, probably sometime between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. And the next thing he knew, it was Christmas morning. The kids were awake and they wanted to open their Christmas presents. But Zazel was unresponsive. She was not moving. She was cold to the touch. But Wallace didn't immediately call paramedics. He did not call for help. What he did instead was so horrific that it's difficult to picture. As Zazel's daughters jumped around, excited that it was finally Christmas morning, Wallace carried Zazel out into the living room, propped her up on the couch, put sunglasses over her eyes, and told the children to open up their Christmas presents. He told the children, Mommy got drunk and ruined Christmas, but you go ahead and open up your presents. And that's where the paramedics and the police had found Zazel, slumped on the sofa, unresponsive, with sunglasses on her head, in front of her children on Christmas morning, December 25th, 2011. Zazel was surely already dead at this point. Likely realizing that he had to do something at this point, this problem was not going away, Wallace finally called for help. He first called Zazel's family complaining that she couldn't wake up. They begged him to call the police, which he finally did. And it was well after 9 a.m. when the medics finally arrived. Wallace was arrested that day, Christmas Day and he remained in jail while the district attorney built the case against him. He was charged with first-degree murder. His bail was set at $1 million, and instead of posting bail, which he was unable to do, Wallace remained in custody at the Theo Lacey facility in California, awaiting his trial. Wallace had pled not guilty to the charge of first-degree murder. First-degree murder means that the prosecution has to prove that there was premeditation before the murder took place. And shockingly, Wallace's trial would not begin until nine years later. I don't have many details as to why his trial was delayed so long. The only information I have is that a grand jury indicted Wallace in April 2012, and his trial was set to begin later that year. But Wallace's attorney convinced the judge that the district attorney's office hadn't presented the grand jury with all of the evidence that might have worked in Wallace's favor. The case was then dismissed, and the district attorney had to refile and start all over. Rather than go to the grand jury again, a new prosecutor decided to go the more common preliminary hearing route and ask a judge to find sufficient evidence to hold Wallace over for trial. And following hours of testimony from four prosecution witnesses, that was what happened. And Wallace would wait until March 8, 2021, for his first-degree murder trial to finally begin. What happened as a result of his trial, we'll get to in a few minutes. But let's go back to Zazel's death and what happened immediately afterwards. 
The funeral of Zazel Preston was a sad but a bittersweet event in which dozens and dozens of friends and family members celebrated her life. It was held at Gospel Light Church of God in Christ in Santa Ana, California. Many shared joyous memories of the woman nicknamed ZZ. Attendees dressed in white or pink, Zazel's favorite color, and some wore fedora hats to honor her. Around the time of her funeral, a reporter from the Orange County Register began speaking with Zazel's family and he was granted special access into their lives as he set out to cover the story of Zazel's murder. In January of 2012, within a week of Zazel's death, the reporter talked to Anaheim Councilwoman Lori Galloway, who ran the Eli Home for Abused Women and Children in Anaheim, California. Lori was also a longtime friend of the Preston family. Lori told the reporter that Zazel had confided in her about the beatings that she had suffered during she and Wallace's three-year relationship. She had also told others they had all begged her to leave Wallace. Lori told the reporter, quote, This is the story of a girl who had access to resources, but she thought she could handle it. These men are experts at apologizing. The women think they can change them. Lori wanted Zazel's story told, that perhaps her story could somehow save another woman who happened across it and read about it. At Zazel's funeral, Lori said that Zazel's life had profound meaning and purpose. She said, quote, She has something to say to every young person who stays in a relationship with someone who does not treat them with respect and dignity. She has something to say to every friend, family member, minister of the gospel, or counselor who has remained silent or passively accepted the evil and dangers of domestic violence. She has something to say to each of us that we must substitute caution for courage. After Zazel's death, her children were placed in the custody of her parents. Her children were already familiar with her grandparents and it was decided that that was the best place for them. At the time, however, Zazel's parents lived in a seniors only complex. They couldn't take the children there the Eli Home Women's Shelter stepped in and they let Zazel's parents and her children move into a vacant shelter home that wasn't being used and the family was offered a discounted rental cost to live in the house. The entire Anaheim community came out to help as well. Eli Home offered counseling, which was clearly what the children needed, but the nonprofit also arranged for a special holiday season on their first Christmas without their mother in 2012. It was the first anniversary of Zazel's death. The Anaheim Hilton put up the family in a 12th floor suite and gave them a three day stay at a resort in Palm Springs, a fully decorated Christmas tree, a wagon of toys and spending money, and on Christmas day, Disneyland hosted the family. Classmates and teachers at Cypress College, where Zazel attended classes, also held a candlelight vigil in her memory after her death. They organized fundraisers to raise money for the children, and the college offered a discussion and a lecture titled Real Men Don't Hit in the months after her death. A person involved with that lecture said this, It's more important to be safe and to be safe for your children than to try and make a toxic situation work. It's an eye-opener for people who think that if they just try harder, it will work. One person cannot fix an abusive relationship through willpower alone. It takes a lot of counseling and learning about self-esteem. As I mentioned before, the first degree murder trial of William Wallace did not start until March of 2021. I wondered about the long delay and I'm not sure what led to it. One thought is that the evidence initially gathered may not have been strong enough for a first degree case. So investigators needed a longer amount of time to build that case. Another thought is that the gruesome detail about what Wallace did with Zazel's body on Christmas morning, propping her up on the couch, putting sunglasses on her, and having her, quote, watch the children unwrap Christmas presents, 
That detail perhaps didn't immediately come out in the grand jury. And as of 2013 and 2014, when the reporter following Zazel's case closely was still writing updates about the case, that detail had not been shared. I wonder if when that piece of information and evidence was discovered, whether Wallace's lawyer had looked into an insanity plea for his client, had looked into whether he needed mental health evaluation. This is just speculation, of course. I'm not sure what work was being done on the case during all those years. And of course, when that gruesome and shocking detail was released, the trial had already started, and Zazel's case made national headlines. At Wallace's trial, the jurors were tasked with considering a variety of possible charges, from involuntary manslaughter to first-degree murder. As they sifted through testimony from witnesses that in some cases appeared to be at odds with statements that they gave nearly a decade earlier in the hours after Zazel's death. To me, of course, that those statements were not consistent is not too surprising since so much time had passed. In the end, William Wallace was convicted of second-degree murder. He was convicted and sentenced on June 4, 2021 to 15 years to life in prison. He was given credit for the nine years in jail he spent waiting for his trial to begin. And Wallace did not choose to speak at his sentencing when given the chance. I guess he didn't have a lot to say now. But there was one person who had been waiting a very long time to speak. Zazel's mother, the guardian of her three children, described Wallace as a psychopath with a hair-triggered temper who only cared about himself. She said, he beat and tortured my daughter and he mentally assassinated her children. He showed her no mercy. Let's show him no mercy. She went on, William Wallace robbed us of Zazel's knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Zazel was an amazing and talented young woman until he came along and took her from us forever. Following the conviction, the Orange County prosecuting attorney made this statement. A young mother finally losing her life after years of violence at the hands of her husband is a heart-wrenching tragedy. That heartbreak is only exacerbated by the fact that her children witnessed much of the violence and were forced to celebrate Christmas in the presence of their dead mother. We all have an obligation to speak up against violence of any kind, especially domestic violence, where the victims are so fiercely controlled by their abusers. The cycle of domestic violence is a vicious one, and I want every victim of domestic violence to know that they are not alone. No one should have to live in fear of violence in their own home. One sad and ironic footnote to this horrible story is that the very apartment where Zazel lived and the apartment in which she suffered numerous beatings and horrible treatment from her boyfriend, fiance, and husband was only a stone's throw from a police station. The apartment complex where the family lived backed up to an Anaheim City police substation. The police station can even be seen in the photos outside Zazel's apartment. That beautiful woman and her children were so close to help, yet so far. In the end, Zazel Preston was so much more than just a victim who made headlines because of the vicious and gruesome details surrounding her death. She was a vivacious and beautiful woman who unfortunately had the wrong person enter her life. Rest in peace to Zazel Preston and may her memory be a peaceful blessing to all her friends and family. Thank you for your time and watching this video. I know that your time is valuable, and I'm so glad that you chose to spend some of it watching this story with me. Please let me know what you thought about it in the comment section below. I love to hear what you have to say. And if you have made it to the end of this video and you're still watching, you know I appreciate you even more. And until next time, everyone, as always, please take care. It's rough out there. Take care, everyone. I'll be thinking about you. Bye-bye now.